Hi, I'm Matthias, and this is, once again, Colt's Patent Firearms Belt-Sized Navy Caliber Pistol, among many other names. Although, it's now a bit shinier than last time. Let's get in the light box. You'll never believe me when I say that it is 13 inches in length and weighs just over two and a half pounds, because it's almost identical to last episode's model. The difference being, of course, the trigger guard and back strap are now constructed of brass, which actually was the original construction, and would often be silver plated, though of course in this reproduction model's case, they didn't go that far. We still have a six round 36 caliber cylinder, which of course is loaded from the front and capped at the back. Just like last episode, this one would not be possible without the use of Rock Island Auction's extensive image library. So if you're enjoying the show, head on over and give them our thanks. While you're at it, I highly recommend browsing their current and prior listings. Their high-resolution photography offers collectors a ready-made archive of exceptionally rare cult antiques. These episodes also generate a lot of questions about value or how to handle authentication. Sadly, neither of those are part of our core mission or documentary series. They are, however, services that you can likely find over at Rock Island. We just ramble on about the past. They tend to handle cults in the present. Images and expertise aside, this show is made with hard work and, like everything else, currency. Almost every bill we have is paid for by you, the viewer, or at least those of you who have decided to become patrons. So thank you for making this all possible. Additional support has also come... Oh, good lord. You know, I should set this up, but I actually use it ballastol. The gun oil that has long been preserving history in the little physical sense, and now intellectually as well. I'm very happy to have them as our sponsor because we were already customers, and frankly, it's the only thing that I have been able to trust these irreplaceable treasures too. Black powder especially, even in the form of reproduction, is very corrosive, so cleaning right after shooting is critical. Dilute your ballastol in water and whip up some moose milk, and make sure to keep it next to any of your black powder firearms ever ready to defend against the ravages of time or your own carelessness. And of course, please pop Ballastol a message of thanks on our behalf for making this show possible. For anyone confused, this is our second episode on Colt's Navy Revolver, commonly but fairly incorrectly known as the model of 1851. Last time we covered its development up until the creation of the London models, which we then discussed through their service in England and Canada. Today we're going to cover the history of this pistol as manufactured in the United States, and largely how it was used in US service. For that, we'll need to rewind a bit back into 1848. Recall the last time we discussed a US service pistol, it was the Dragoon model of 1848. These were sold to the government for $25 each with accessories. That price was extremely high, as the government could secure almost four single-shot cavalry pistols in place of one Colt revolver. Of course, the Colt had six shots. That $25 price tag, by the way, represents a significant discount from the $28 cost of the previous Walker revolver. According to Colt, these amounts were necessary because of the high cost of tooling up. If the government would just order more guns, he could reduce the cost for each. We take this economy of scale for granted these days, but at the time, it wasn't easily understood by people accustomed to individual artisanal production. Even so, Colt was also clearly holding onto a very generous margin for himself. Much of the resistance against Samuel Colt came from the Chief of Ordnance, George Talcott. He had to constantly police Colt's attempted amendments to their contracts and his eager need for payment. This made Talcott cautious of the inventor, and he worked diligently to limit the number of pistols ordered. At this point, the US had actually placed orders for 1,000 walkers, followed quickly after by 1,000 more, which were produced with improvements that ultimately made them into what we now call the Dragoons. These were all large, 44 caliber revolvers meant to be hung in a holster attached to the saddle, not a man's belt. In messages between President Polk and the Secretary of War, it became apparent that they had only two options, accept Colt's prices or have no revolvers at all. That's because he still held tight control over a comprehensive patent. This had been granted, however, in 1836 and was due to expire soon, so ordnance felt that they just had to wait him out. Then, market pressure would provide them better and cheaper options. Unfortunately, in 1848, Colt secured a patent extension. His prices were now secure until 1857. 
So while Ordnance was stuck with the pricing, they at least tried to limit the number of orders. This resulted in a smattering of contracts, each a year or two apart until 1860. You might notice Dragoon sales fall off after 1855. That has a lot to do with our firearm today. Just to remind you from last time, once Colt had the big 44 caliber army revolver figured out, he turned to capture the civilian market with a tiny Pocket 32. This direction was an excellent choice, as the Pocket model, along with all its changes, was the best-selling Colt product through Samuel's lifetime. The obvious gap left in the market was something in between the Pocket and leaving your gun on your horse. Once Colt gained some more factory space, he introduced something to plug that hole. The result was a downscaled Dragoon with a 36 caliber chambering, a seven and a half inch standard barrel length. The earliest version also attempted to simplify the construction of the arbor and its locking cross block. Samuel Colt showed this revolver to the army in late 1850. Well, an earlier version of it. It was test fired in November and a favorable report was filed by Chief of Ordnance Talcott. The revolver was effective up to 200 yards and at 30 yards could penetrate pine boards up to seven and a half inches. These were one and a half inch thick boards with some space between each, I don't know how much. Officers felt the pistol was more comfortable and versatile than the Dragoon. However, there were no contracts forthcoming. While I'm certain Colt kept up his usual pressure, there would be no real interest for years in the US. Given the lack of purchases of belt models and the slow sales of holster models, it's likely that US ordnance disinterest is what drove him to engage so heavily with the British Empire for sales. And that's why we spent last episode covering all of that angle of the story. And it actually times out fairly well because US ordnance didn't come back for this belt model until 1855. In the meantime, however, it had actually been selling quite well in the commercial market, and it had advanced slightly in design. Early in 1851, the locking wedge was flipped back over and the arbor cut became a hole once more. That same year, the trigger guard became rounded instead of the old style square back, which tended to rough up holsters and pockets alike on the draw. This held until around serial number 30,500 which seems to have been in 1853, so swift sails there. At this point, the extension lug beneath the barrel became thicker and stronger. This pattern remained fairly consistent until about 1858, though the cutout to aid loading pointed bullets did change in size and shape over the years. As for why the belt model was selling so well, much of the initial interest had been driven by the California gold rush and westward expansion in general, following the Mexican-American War. Turns out the former Mexican territory of California was chock full of resources. It was also largely open territory without the infrastructure or law enforcement to keep up with the massive influx of people. Personal defense was a top priority, be it against a uh, beast or man, and Colt's pricey revolving pistols were among the very best friends one could have on his own in the frontier. Interestingly enough, the six-shooter was also popular with Mexicans who had heard of its devastating effects firsthand. As usual, the world's greatest salesman wasn't sitting idly by. He often gifted revolvers where they would do the most good. For him, not for anyone else. Attempting to sell more revolvers, he gifted a pair to Lajos Kossuth, governor-president of the Kingdom of Hungary during its revolution of 1848. Another set were sent to Giuseppe Garibaldi, who at the time was leading his legion in the First Italian War of Independence. While he might have made it quick cash with either or both of these revolutionaries, Neither were particularly rich. Instead, his tactic was to create an arms race which would drive Austrian purchases. This theme would repeat itself fairly often. He uh, sold revolvers to rebels in Cuba and then gifted a pair to the governor general of Cuba. Or when he had surplus muskets from the Russian contract, he surplused them to traders heading west, putting powerful and inexpensive rifles in the hands of the Native Americans on the frontier. This in turn drove sales of equipment to the US Army who had to fight the Native Americans on the frontier. Colt also gifted a pair of revolvers to Brigham Young, leader of the Mormons who led them to Salt Lake Valley, which had become part of the Utah Territory thanks to the Mexican War. Young appreciated the gesture, as many people were not very happy with the Mormons' mission at the time. He would buy hundreds more Colt revolvers to stock their stores. 
My favorite story, however, involves the Episcopal Church's most reverend Thomas Church Brownell, who received his revolver from Samuel Colt on the occasion of his home being burgled. It included a very Samuel Colt letter. I take the liberty to send you a copy of my latest work on moral reform. Trusting that, in the event of further depredations being attempted, the perpetrators may experience a feeling effect of the moral influence of my work. Reverend Brownell actually responded with praise, thanks, and an invitation that Colt might come by and instruct him in its use. Colt's revolvers were also provided to Admiral Perry's expedition to Japan, 25 pocket models, 25 dragoons, and 50 of our model today, brand new at the time. The sales generated by these tactics would ultimately make Samuel Colt a wealthy man. However, he knew his uh, production had not remotely reached its true potential. So he looked around uh, for land on which to erect a massive and truly modern facility uh, that would be able to produce more arms at even lower prices. Looking to stay along the Connecticut River to better ease loading onto ships, he chose a large parcel of land known as the South Meadows. At the time, this was mostly useless due to annual flooding, making it inexpensive. His plan was to emulate the Dutch and build a dike around the property. He carefully began buying parcels in the meadows in 1852. If anyone knew what he was up to, regardless of the steep cost of preparing the land, they would try to bill him more. Eventually, the word did get out, and he met some resistance. A parcel owned by the Hartford Bank shot up an asking price beyond all reason. The story goes that Samuel Colt bought up every one of their banknotes that he could lay hands on, and carrying more than the town's wealth in a satchel, walked into the president's office demanding a fair price, or he'd own the bank by day's end. Other resistance came from here. See the spot marked Colonel S. Porter? That's someone who refused to sell. Samuel Colt, therefore, erected a house on the edge of his property and promptly rented it to a madam, who, of course, ran it as a house of ill repute. This infuriated the owner of the adjoining property, but failed to run him off. In 1853, clearing of the land began, as did the construction of the dike. They even went so far as to import willows from Holland, which, once in place, provided another sort of business. The branches were used for manufacturing willowware furniture and baskets, a market that Samuel Colt found inefficient, so he imported an entire Dutch village, and then mechanized parts of their process. They only allowed this when he guaranteed to pay the same piece rate despite their use of machines. With the willows firmly in the ground, the dike quickly rose to 25 feet, seemingly freeing the land from the threat of flood, until the river rose to record 28 feet, 10 and 1 half inch in 1854. Hartford had a great laugh at Colt's undoing, but he simply raised the dike to 33 feet and kept on working. We'll discuss the construction of his new facilities more in our next episode. For now, however, Colt decided it might be best to further shore up his patents. Yes, this is again the original from 1836, which had been extended once until 1857. Now in 1854, he sought to add another seven years to this patent. That's a lot. Kind of reminds me of Disney and copyright. Colt managed to massage his friends into submitting a bill to Congress to get his further extension. And this time, it didn't go as well. Now Chief of Ordnance Henry Knox Craig caught wind of the matter, and sounded the alarm with then-Secretary of War Jefferson Davis. Craig pointed out to him that while the bill included a proviso that the government was allowed to manufacture their own arms under the patent, it stipulated that these had to be made in their own government armories. There was no way that the US government was going to afford setting up a whole modern factory just for revolvers. This carve-out was useless, let alone the insanity of providing a monopoly for so long on one patent. Shortly after the bill was shot down, a furious backlash followed. Virginian Congressman John Letcher headed a committee to investigate how Samuel Colt got his original extension and this new bill moreover. The accusation was one of bribery and corruption, of course. Samuel Colt was attacked in the press, and controversy swirled. He, however, relished it, sending copies of scathing articles to all of his friends, and requesting copies of all transcripts of the meetings in which his name was hurled about. For Colt, there was no such thing as bad press. He's America's original hype man. The legal threat to himself, or his political allies, however, evaporated quite quickly. 
New York Representative Michael Walsh, noting the fervor and organization of those who were pursuing Colt's involvement in Scandal, proposed an amendment to the resolution. This asked that the committee also investigate whether any money or other valuable consideration had been paid by any person encouraging an investigation of the patent extension. Insisting that he'd put this to a vote, the whole matter was quietly dropped. It seems that Colt's opposition in the market had learned to play his games. Also, in 1854, Colt's patent firearms was incorporated with capital of $1 million. The vast majority of this was retained by Samuel Colt himself, who, by the way, took a trip to Russia towards the end of that same year. There, he met with officials of the Russian army and was granted a private audience with Tsar Nicholas I at his winter palace in Kachina. Colt must have made a strong impression because a contract for 5,036 caliber belt-sized pistols was signed. Both Colt and his lawyer were given diamond rings with the Tsar's monogram. I'd like to point out this was during the Crimean War. You know, the war in which Colt was already supplying arms to the British. And Russia was every bit as excited as England to secure modern arms for its soldiers. They actually wanted a contract for much larger numbers of muskets. While that's beyond our scope today, I will repeat an interesting story. Apparently, the Russians wanted their own inspector to be placed in Hartford for the musket contract, but the British controlled the sea routes to the US. Samuel Colt asked them to provide a man who could pass as German or Polish, who they disguised as Colt's valet. Mind you, if he was caught, they would be charged with espionage. Traveling home, the Russian inspector spent several weeks in London with his new employer, before returning with him to the US, securing the Russian purchases. In theory, the Russian Colts should have looked like this one here, what collectors call a middle third model, though some have more of a cutout, like what they call a late third model. I find this sort of breakdown confusing versus just listing each change in manufacture and its rough serial range, allowing for some overlap. While the initial contract was for 5,000, it seems more were provided, though it isn't clear to me how many. The Russian contracts had to be smuggled as well, and twice this met with disaster, both times in Prussia, which during the Crimean War was neutral and banned the shipment of weapons to Russia unless previously approved by King Wilhelm IV. The first was a shipment caught in Aachen in August of 1855. This contained 3,480 revolvers along with accessories. These were supposedly replaced with stock from the London factory, shipped through the Netherlands. In 1856, another 3,000 were confiscated, traveling through Bremen. This did not amuse the Prussians. Heavy duties and fines were imposed on both shipments. Colt sent agents to attempt to recover the seized arms for an economical amount. However, their demands were too high to be of much profit, and they weren't inclined to be flexible. These were later sold at auction, roughly 1,000 of them being bought by the Prussian government, who then fielded them with their navy. You can spot them by a large KM marking on the backstrap near the hammer, along with a designation number. It's believed the initials stand for Königliche Marine, which I'm probably pronouncing wrong. These revolvers would serve Prussia on through unification, lasting into the 1870s. Russia also negotiated the rights to produce their own copy of the belt pistol at the Tula Arsenal, but this is probably a topic worthy of its own exploration another day. All right, he's sold to the British and the Russians. The commercial market is going great. And Samuel Colt finally has his big new factory, which again, we'll cover another time. That same year, in 1855, he would finally sell the belt model to the US Army. In January, Chief of Ordnance Craig wrote, to Colt's patent firearms asking them to furnish 1,000 more Dragoon-style revolvers. These would be purchased for $24 each, as they had previously negotiated this amount on a contract for 2,000 back in 1851. This had then become the standard price thereafter. Colt immediately responded that these 44 calibers were already available, likely sitting in stock. Craig's response, however, changed the plan. Instead of 1,044 caliber holster pistols, they now wanted them to be 36 caliber belt models. It seems that internal pressure had won out. U.S. Army officers had been privately purchasing their own belt-sized Colts, and they were much handier to use. The pistol itself was easier on the hand. Recoil was downright pleasant by comparison, though the cartridge was still effective. More importantly, however, wearing them tucked in the belt or with a belted holster meant that the pistol stayed with the man even when he got off of his horse. 
Their opinions finally caught the ears of the Secretary of War and the Chief of Ordnance. Now it was just a matter of exactly what they wanted out of the little pistol. A standard belt-sized revolver had a brass grip frame and trigger guard. These may or may not be silver-plated. The stocks were varnished, shiny. Around the same time, a factory-fitted dovetailed front sight was also optional. The London model offered an iron trigger guard and backstrap. The Hartford factory had also produced roughly 650 revolvers with iron trigger guards. These may actually predate the British-made guns. By the way, the most glaring reason for the introduction of an iron backstrap in the US market would be to reinforce the pistols for a shoulder stock. Again, however, the timing seems to be off. To my knowledge, Colt didn't take on stocks until being introduced to what would become the Springfield model of 1855. While early examples of Colt's iron guards clearly predate this, later examples do appear with stock attachment fittings. Just like the Dragoons, the first belt models to be stocked used the Springfield 1855 lockup, which was unacceptably fragile. Colt would add some reinforcement before finally hitting on a strong enough method. This, however, was an unusual feature, and one we'll cover in more detail when we get to a later model Colt. Ultimately, Ordnance chose a fairly standard belt model, brass fittings with no silver plating, unvarnished grips, and bluing was left somewhat dull. In July, another order was placed for an additional 1,000 of these pistols. This was likely due to Congress's authorization to organize two new cavalry units. This time, they wanted to ditch the naval scene that is engraved on the cylinder. Instead, they would like the words Ordnance Department apply. The delay necessary to make this change happen, however, wasn't acceptable to Ordnance, so they ultimately ended up with standard cylinders. Once again, my example here is a reproduction, and it's honestly no different than the one from our last episode, except, of course, for the brass fittings in place of the... Well, technically, these are supposed to be blued iron, but I don't think it's even iron in this case. So we can probably skip the inspection and get straight to letting May shoot this thing now that the U.S. government is buying them. You know, that looked a lot like last time, including the use of paper cartridges. For a British episode, that made a lot of sense, but 
Here it's a bit premature. Initial orders of the Colt revolvers included bullet molds and flasks. However, by the late 1850s, the US government was also buying and assembling cartridges. These became even more common during the war to come. But before that, we have pistols to buy. So far, we have 2,000 in the bag for the US government. That's not a bad start. However, over the next few years, orders would only come in at a trickle. Many of these actually being for state militias. In the meantime, Colt's prices weren't going over well with ordnance. Remember, his patent was finally expiring, and even before that, they were making plans. Colonel Craig, then Chief of Ordnance, was frankly furious at Colt's antics. Facing a restrictive budget, he had no patience for high prices, and he knew Colt was cheating the government. That's because he had access to the British government reports, which just so happened to include the price that they paid for their revolvers. The rate in the US was $24 for a revolver and accessories. Converting from pound sterling, the British had paid about $12.50 for this same product. Even on the surface, this would not do. It gets worse when you know that the scent of corruption and bribery was also in the air. In 1856, Watertown Arsenal military storekeeper William A. Newman was court-martialed out of the service. He had written letters to the adjutant generals of Virginia and Pennsylvania that we know of, attempting to elicit specific requests to the general government for Colt's revolvers in particular. He also included the following language. I think that I can make it an object for yourself, pecuniarily to do so. I am authorized by Colonel Colt to make arrangements of this nature. He goes on to ask them that they please tell him of the equipment requested by the state, and he would then inform them what inducements could be offered. That's bad, or at least getting caught at it was, because it's basically bribery. So ordinance, or at least some of ordinance, was all too happy to consider alternatives to Colt's revolvers, because they're fairly certain good old Sam was involved. In 1856, a possible answer came through the then retired major of the US Army, Roswell Ripley, who later on would rise to Brigadier General in the Confederate Army. At this time, however, he was a businessman representing the US interests of the London Armory Company. He managed to sell Ordnance 113 examples of their best product, the Beaumont Adams Revolver, with a Care Rammer. This was a large bore five shot triple action revolver. They were delivered in January of 1857. Most importantly, however, they were priced at $18 each with accessories. Ordnance appreciated the design and requested 500 more. Around the same time, they were also trialing another revolver. An early iteration of North and Savage's ring cocking gas seal design. These were $20 each, 100 samples were ordered. These low price small batch revolver contracts gave Craig the ammunition that he needed to battle it out with Colt. At first, he managed a concession price of $20 per revolver, as low as $18 if 5,000 were ordered. Through several small orders in 1857, Craig kept insisting on the price of $18 for the belt model pistols and their accessories regardless of how many were ordered. Colt would in turn accept the orders, but never commented on the price. Then he would bill at the full price, and then they would fight and he would run and tattle the Secretary of War whenever ordnance fought back. Creating confusion in all directions, Colt also attempted to deliver the revolvers without their accessories, which if he was being paid $18, would then charge separately. The Secretary of War let him get away with this. The cost was of course $2 per set, setting us right back to where we started. Craig clamped down on this as well. The whole thing spun around and around and around until the army decided that they really did need 3,000 more belt-sized revolvers. Craig merged this with a naval request for 2,000, creating a lump sum of 5,000 in one unit order in November of 1857. For this, Colt would then reduce to the $18 plus accessories price tag. He was, however, not too happy to find out that this was for the two branches of the armed forces instead of one. Still, a new price was set, at least for a while. The next year's request for 1,600 more pistols was actually quite controversial as well in another way. 
Supplying the U.S. Army outposts in the Far West was something of an undertaking. Commercial freight contractors were, for a time, hired ad hoc in very small bids. However, in 1854, the War Department offered up a single, all-encompassing contract to last two years. This meant that only a big organization could compete. Three men, two partners in a wholesale trading company and one that owned his own smaller freight company, formed together to bid for, and eventually won, the contract. Their names were Russell, Majors, and Waddell, and you'll never guess what they named their firm. In 1860, these men would go on to found the now very famous Pony Express Mail Service. But that's not our story today. As contracted freighters, RMW apparently approached the government for firearms with which to protect their men and the deliveries. At this time, however, there was no provision in the law or policy of the army for arming commercial interests with firearms that were actually owned by the U.S. government in new territory. Secretary of War John Floyd, however, pushed the matter forward without any real authority, directing the firm to be supplied a whopping 3,500 Colt revolvers. The Chief of Ordnance responded that he had ordered the issue of 1,900 available, but that had exhausted the government's supply entirely. 1,600 more had to be ordered from Colts, though I'm unsure if they were passed on to the commercial freighters or simply used to restock the losses. The freighters were apparently quite rough on their issued equipment, revolvers and rifles alike. When returned to ordnance, they were in awful condition. Go figure, they didn't own them. Frankly, Floyd was in a corrupt financial arrangement with Russell in particular. This would explode just after the start of the war. When it was exposed that he had been granting the freight firm uh, acceptances? Essentially, a memoranda approving future payments. Russell then used the, these acceptances as securities on loans, Eventually, the whole thing collapsed, and Floyd was forced to resign, after which it was found that he had been doing quite a good job of helping the southern states. Following John Brown's raid, he had shipped more armaments into federal arsenals in the south, along with heavy ordnance into Texas and Mississippi. These, of course, rapidly fell into Confederate hands once the fighting was on. Army use of the 36 caliber before the war is a bit hard to track. Stray reports put them in the hands of various dragoon regiments, and many were sent over to the California Cavalry at the start of the war. They also appear in inventory with the 1st Artillery b Battery and with Horse Artillery. Rounding out our contracts, 368 were ordered in July of 1858, specifically earmarked for Texas, actually. And then in August, 5,000 more, intentions unknown. Accepted pistols are usually, but not always, marked U.S. on the left side of the frame and should have inspectors' cartouches on their grips. These initials vary over the years as inspectors came and went. Now, all this might be confusing for you if you constantly heard this being called Colt's Navy Revolver. Where's the Navy? Well, in theory, they did beat out the Army, kind of. In 1852, 50 were purchased for the Perry Expedition. They should not be considered a military contract, though, as they were gifts for foreign officials. The first true order was in 1856. Again, for only 50 pistols, these were bound for the St. Mary's. Significant purchases didn't start until 1857. Between May and August, there were a smattering of small lots, which I'm frankly not going to walk down. There's still some debate if we're missing any contracts, and the total number of Navy orders has changed in various books on the subject, given uh, we have to make an episode every other week. I'm not likely to crack this case for you. Regardless, in September of 1857, the Navy received 1,270, and December, another 2,000 these being part of the 5,000 unit lot that irritated Sam Colt so much. Another 600 arrived in 1859. Identifying Navy Colts can be a bit difficult. Naval markings can be somewhat varied and were applied ad hoc or not at all. Many were actually applied during later inventory or refurbishment. Even the US marking on the left side of the frame is common, but not guaranteed. If you're looking for more detail, especially hoping to confirm an original piece, there's no way I can cover all of those details in this video. Instead, I'd recommend contacting an appraiser and ordering the book Colt 1851 and 1861 Navies and Conversions by Jordan and Gary. In general, however, the earlier Navy contracts are much like the Army's, unvarnished grips, standard barrel length. However, they did curiously opt for the iron grip strap and trigger guard. 
early examples seem to use leftover parts from the London factory, as they have fairly flat bottom trigger guards. During the era of Army and Navy purchases, the belt model still managed to evolve, by the way. Around 1858, a larger trigger guard was introduced, this of course being made of brass as standard. Navy contracts kept with iron, now made in the US. These matched the domestic large pattern. This same configuration was sold commercially, also somewhat regularly to British colonial police. Total pre-war sales to the Navy would eventually climb to a rough estimate of just 4,000 pistols. By this time, we know that the Army had at least 16,900 passed through their hands, some of these of course going to state militias. There is some suggestion that up to 2,000 more were bought on the open market. While we are talking pre-war Colts, I should mention that it seems 1,000 were supplied to Austria in 1859. These were, of course, sporting large brass trigger guards. This order is often confused for the Prussian-seized KM-marked revolvers. Now, at this point, the Colt belt model had been in production for nine years, and the holster model 44 for over a decade. Colt had been fairly distracted by a whole other style of wheel gun for several years now. However, it was time to introduce some new products, ones protected by fresh patents. The first would be what we now call the model of 1860, a 44 caliber army model, now in a package the same size as the old belt model. Shortly thereafter, an improved 36 caliber was also introduced making our gun today the old model navy by the time of the Civil War. Even so, sales for what we call the 1851 didn't come to a halt, especially not with the outbreak of that American Civil War. With shots fired at Sumter in April of 1861, there was mobilization of the army and various state militias. However, the northern states sort of underestimated the South's resourcefulness and resolve. By example, in May and June of 1861, the government placed orders for 7,300 additional Colt revolvers. From what we've seen so far, that's a significant contract. But in hindsight, we know that this was nowhere near enough for the war that was to come. The upset at Bull Run finally kicked U.S. ordnance into gear, and orders began flowing much more freely. At the same time, Samuel Colt, and to be fair, many others, saw a great opportunity for profit. Now 70 years old, Chief of Ordnance Craig was relieved of his duties. The new Secretary of War, Simon Cameron, gave the excuse that younger and more vigorous leadership was necessary for the war. With Craig gone, Colt's prices shot right back up to $25 a revolver, though I believe this was targeted more towards that new model of 1860. Even so, over 30,000 Colt revolvers of all types would be purchased at this horrible price. However, this and other wastage soon demanded uh, calls of corruption. The Secretary of War was replaced with someone more conscientious towards the taxpayer in January of 1862. Shortly after, a commission was formed to investigate government overspending on ordnance contracts. This Owen Holt Commission took note of some interesting issues. Frankly, it's a bit out of scope for us today because it's a story better told with that aforementioned Colt 1860 model. However, as a result of the Commission's decisions, Colt's patent firearms was forced to reduce their prices. First down to $14.50 and then to $14 flat. Well, in theory, this worked out for the Army and their newer 44, but not so much for the Navy. Colt simply refused to keep the price lower for them as well, so they would turn to Remington and Whitney to provide their revolvers going forward, meaning that our gun today fell off of official sales to the government around August of 1862. Frankly, tracking purchases during the war is messy at best. Paperwork is scattered and incomplete. And apparently many examples have, may have been purchased from the private market, not directly from Colt. Rough estimates place another 8,000 in army inventories during the war, along with upwards of 3,400 more for the Navy. Just to be clear, these are estimations made by various researchers, likely working from incomplete data. I should also point out that despite being replaced by the 1861, the old model Navy kept being manufactured and improved. Sometime in 1862, an extra groove appeared in the recoil shield. This helped aid in capping the pistol. And starting in 1863, the latch was upgraded. It was knurled on the sides and the catch itself was thickened up. Now, it might seem like a bad decision to stop selling to the U.S. Navy, especially when it's your old model that the Army doesn't even use anymore. But even the old model Navy was selling out of stores as fast as they could be put into stock, thanks to demands for private arms during the war. 
they were extremely popular, and with the smaller lots requested by the Navy, it's likely that Colt stood to lose more money selling to the government than to the public, who were eager to pay full retail price for a known reliable product. Well, mostly reliable. The number one complaint on these little guys is that the barrels would burst. However, this wasn't generally the fault of the pistol itself. Instead, uh, it seems that poor quality or severely worn holsters tended to open up at the muzzle end. And then when you sit down and stand up a few times in that good old dirt, you get it packed up in the bore, and when you go to fire, blammo. I mean, the wrong kind of blammo. Overall, roughly 215,000 belt models, the old model Navy type, were produced at Colts. And don't forget the roughly 38,000 made in London. While it was outsold by the pocket model, this still isn't a bad showing at all, leagues beyond any of its competitors. All right, we will of course hear more about Samuel Colt and his empire in our next repercussion episode. Before that, however, let's get May's opinion, finally, on the belt model. Once more, we've made room for May. Hey! And we have a smorgasbord. I mean, yeah, we have a sampling. Yeah. That's okay. a good, it's a okay sample platter at this point. Yeah. We have uh, essentially the same gun three times. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you right out front. The uh, Mama, Papa, and Baby being the Dragoon, the Navy, and mm -hmm. the Pocket. And all three of these guns were produced consecutively together. They all saw evolutions together. So they end up with a lot of the same features at the same times as the factory changed what it was doing. Externally and internally, pretty much. There's some little bit of variation, Yeah, right? there, there's a little bit of change. Um, we can get into all sorts of arguments about when a wheel was added to the hammer or the fact that the Dragoon took a lot longer to come around to having the wingalings on the um, loading ram. Right. But it's pretty much these are little evolutions that happen along the way. Sure. Collectors like to classify them in models. I've talked about this. I prefer to just talk about when the changes happened as one sort of spectrum. Timeline. It, it's one gun. It just has a, a spectrum of concepts. Mm -hmm. It's very odd to me, actually. I'm sorry. I'm going to go on the side. I know people okay, love this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's very odd to me that in American collecting history, we have sub models for guns that weren't considered models in and of themselves. So there's all these sub versions of the gun we saw today, the 1851, which isn't even from 1851. But then we talk about the Springfield 1903 rifle. Mm -hmm. Cartridge 30-06. Sure. It's a 1903 rifle, but the bayonet for it is from 1905 and the cartridge is from 1906 because they were three models. Well, it's a 1903-05-06 then, right? Right, but no one says 1903-05. No one says 1903-05-06. That's anywhere. a bit of a mouthful. And, and it's because there was a military designation and the designation was blah, 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 blah. The problem is in all military records, this was never called the 1851, nor was it called any sub-model thereof. Mm-hmm. What are we doing, folks? Can we get on the same page? <laughs> no, we never can, because it's whoever wrote whichever book at what time, and then that gets carried forward forever. Pretty much. I like belt model, but it doesn't work because guess what I keep doing? I keep calling that a dragoon, mm -hmm. but that should be the holster model. Right. So I give up. I'm, I'm not uh, applying my own doctrine as well as I should. <laughs> anyway, with that being said. Sure. We need a practical opinion on these things. Okay. Uh, what order would you like to go in? Well, um... Should we go in order we shot them? Okay. So we would have shot the Patterson, which is not represented here because it's a different type. Right. We then shot the Walker, which we can all agree was just huge. Yes. So no need to do that. And then we have the Walker, sort of. So what we now call the Dragoon mm -hmm. is actually an improved army model. This just it, looks like the Walker. I keep forgetting how big the Walker was until I put it up next to this and I go, oh crap. Yeah, that kind of feels big until you grab a Walker. Yeah. But to be fair... Colt saw this as the walker. Mm -hmm. He saw this as a continuation of that design. He just chopped it back a little bit. Right. That actually makes sense to me, that this is yeah. this and the walker are the same gun, just slightly different. Mm -hmm. So in this, the big Army 44, the yep. holster model, how does that feel? Well, it definitely feels authoritative. Um, it feels like it is... Unfortunately, far too big for a normal person. Probably for you, it's a little more in scale. But right. for me, and for what I would think would be the average soldier hand and size of the time, it feels a little too much to be just a normal carry piece. No, even to me, this thing is the size of what you would consider almost like a novelty weapon today. You see some of these big revolvers chambering 4570 or 500 or something like that. Mm -hmm. Those guns tend to be this big, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, what was it, the nebula? No, no, no. That's actually that. That's not as large as this. I don't believe. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and that's underboard. But uh -huh. I'm, I'm talking about just like big collector Smith and Wessons and things like that. Oh, okay. But um, this thing is heavy. Mm -hmm. It's kind of awkward. There's a lot of reach for that hammer. And then by the time you're coming here, there's a there's, lot of muzzle heaviness there. <laughs> there's, I want to point out, just dropping it, there's enough inertia that it's actually uncomfortable to the wrist. To be fair, you could just use inertia to cock the hammer if you got the right grip on it. Yeah, I hear a lot of people talking about that. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I've never gotten good at letting the weight of the gun do all the work because it feels like I'm throwing the gun instead of controlling it. I mean, you kind of are. Yeah, anyway. Okay, so we went from that. Yep. To, so you said authoritative. This was 44 caliber. Right. Yep. 44 caliber, authoritative cartridge for the time. Mm hmm. And then, actually, weirdly, kind of a small cartridge for the time in some ways. A lot of 50 cal and oversized. That's true, there was 50. Yeah. yeah. Like, there's pistols in 58, 50, you know, things like that. Yep. Um, but big, awkward, heavy. Very much so, yes. You, you would not want to carry that on your hip. Uh,. Not me personally, no. Uh, granted, if I'm trying to make a statement, yes, absolutely. But if, if I'm if I'm actually thinking of practical use on it, not really the best option for me. I want to say if I had to carry that on my hip and cinch my belt tight enough for it to work. To actually stay in place. Right, given yeah. that I have very masculine hips and that they're just dead vertical. Mm -hmm. You might do better than I would actually in this yeah, case. Yeah, that's true. I would have to cinch my belt so tight I'd have a digestive disorder. Probably, yes. I would need suspenders. So, Colt came out with a pocket model. This is more something I could see going in a vest pocket, mm -hmm. um, just because know. of its That's actual too, too size. Big for a vest, right? Well, I mean, the vests then were different. They actually had solid pockets. You they think, intended mm, you to put things in them. Mm, Internal vest pocket. I don't know. Okay. Well, anyway, anyway, that's beside the point. Um, this just feels like a joke by comparison. That okay. may be a novelty. This is the novelty joke. Mm -hmm. Because it's so small by comparison, it really just feels like it's absolutely nothing, like a pipsqueak almost. Like, is this even going to do any damage? Is this going to, to put the put the gentleman down, or am I going to have to put a few rounds into him? Uh, in a time before antibiotics, it will oh, kill someone. Oh, wait, that's true, before antibiotics. It's going to kill somebody. It's just, how long is it going to take? Right. Depending on where you plant it, it can be pretty quick, mm -hmm. or it's going to linger. So it is a valid threat. I mean, nobody wanted to be punctured back then. Yeah. But I agree with you. The thirty two caliber bore seems to be a little... Well, I guess technically, is this considered the 31? This is the game. You always have the uh, the lands versus the grooves, mm -hmm. which is, by the way, I should point this out. I don't know if we've said this clearly enough. Those 44s we've been shooting are like a 454 bore, just like a 1911. The same with these 36s. By measuring inside the groove, we end up with a 38 later oh, on. Okay. It makes the gun sound more powerful when we go into the cartridge era, but it's the same bore. So when we're saying, you know, if we're saying 44 versus 45 or 36 versus 38, know that they're actually the same nominal bore. It's just the vernacular changed in terms of what we were referencing in the bore when they wanted to make them seem more powerful. Fair. <laughs> Sorry, I'm also playing with the sights here just because I feel like when it's this short, just picking up the sights, they just don't quite pick up quite as quickly as I would like them to. That's fair. So you really love the pocket model when we shot it. It's adorable, don't get me wrong, and it's very easy for me to handle personally, but it's not something I would put on my hip because that just seems silly. Right, that's true. Uh, it literally is something I would consider more for pocket or, or deep concealment kind of right. thing. And you're going to have to pull it from somewhere. Yeah, that seems weird. Okay. It doesn't really seem like quite the perfect uh, on my hip piece if we want to go for that. So between these two, which would you want to go into combat with? I'd probably go with the 44. Right. Just a bigger caliber. However, this However, leaves an obvious gap. Right. Which is right here. Mm-hmm. So with all of that in mind, when I hand you this, pretending that you have never handled any other firearm. Not Neither, none of these. Except for these two. Oh, okay. So that's my thing is, let's remember, there's very little competition at this time. There's mm -hmm. other guns appearing, but they're pepper boxes with weird grips. You're starting to get stuff. By the time this gun has been out for less than a year, you're really starting to see some competition in Britain that has some interesting grips that May has actually handled. Mm -hmm. However, I want to... Yeah, we've got the, uh, what, the Adams revolver? Yeah, Adams like 1851, okay. and then you quickly get into the Beaumonts. And that's a triple action. Yes, and by the time of Civil War, all sorts of cool stuff's showing up, like what we call the Raphael. Mm -hmm. But... Before any of that, you're going to have to turn off your brain for a second. Okay. And you've only known these sort of what we call plow handle grips. Sure. What does this feel like after you've only handled these other two once it's in your hand? Hmm. The grip actually does feel better. The weight on it feels it's obviously going to be better than 
the walker or the dragoon, whatever it be. Well, I'm not for us. Sorry, I'm thinking walker. That's the dragoon, and vice versa, whatever. Right. Um, definitely doesn't feel quite as muzzle heavy, which is nice. I mean, it can't not possibly feel as muzzle heavy. It feels like it's balanced better. That grip does feel a lot better, though, I will say that. How much, how different is this grip from the actual? Oh, I see. It's got a better taper to it. Yeah, it's essentially a scale down and a slight tightening of the uh, larger grip. Yeah, it's, it you puts you in a better position with the trigger, I would say. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I you like that. Do you feel like you're scooching up and down the gun trying to figure it out very much? No, I don't think so. Not by comparison. I think with the footage, well, obviously with this gun, we were trying to make sure we definitely cleared every single uh, primer or uh, cap, cap that popped back. I will say the caps we were using for this firearm were interesting. Um, being a reproduction, the hammer spring's a little light. Mm -hmm. We found that if we were using one particular brand, it was jumping our hammer. That was interesting to find out. And it would cause problems. <laughs> so we switched to another brand, which would ignite well. They didn't jump the hammer, but boy, they wanted to shatter and stay. Yep. And that was causing cap jam after cap jam, which is not the gun's fault. Or no, no, no. But at least the hammer spring on this guy is actually pretty light. So for me, all <laughs> it required was the actual getting vertical and popping it back. Just the good timing on that pop back of the hammer worked out well. Now, how easy is it to reach that hammer, by the way? Because this is a single action only. You have to manipulate it. It's actually very easy for me to reach it. Okay. Which is saying something. There are a lot of awkward revolvers out there that there have been plenty of them where I've said, it's <laughs> difficult for me to reach or near impossible. I mean, I'm thinking like Enfield, infields yeah that's one. literally where i went with that man oh, that is just God. impossible to be fair that has the most awkward short stuffy little hammer spur. and you're supposed to cock it when it's over center ah, that's insane or when it was over like literally when it's like in line with the center like, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's it has difficult. really bad angles yes so and it's, it's shrouded in there um, so yeah thinking back to that no this is a dream by comparison well, to be fair, that gun came a lot later after this gun, so they have no excuse. It's also got a nice uh, kind of bend up here at the top to it that really kind of snags. It's easy for your thumb to snag it and kind hook. of wrap around it. I'm able to hook pretty easily on this one off to the side, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. Yeah, you struggled doing the wingspan cocking method. Yes. Um, can you do that on the large one, actually? Are you capable of doing the same side hook or no? Not as oh, well. Oh, that's very slow. Not as well. That's fair. But if I, if I let the weight carry it with it, it's a bit easier, but then I'm worried I'm flinging the gun. All right, better grip, better access to the hammer. Mm -hmm. uh, you were talking about the balance. Well, you didn't really say the balance. You just said it was still muzzle heavy, but you didn't give us an impression. Does it feel better balanced than the big boy? Well, obviously, yeah, it's definitely going to be, feel better balanced because there's less weight off the front. Now, is it perfect? No. But to be fair, at the very least, the grip is definitely seems to be helping. It mm -hmm. doesn't quite feel like I'm... I'm, it's trying to slip forward. It reaches a point in which it just kind of falls naturally, yeah, it has which a big, is interesting. Beautiful bell. It actually almost falls perfectly in a line with the front sight. That's so pretty good. When you're holding that, mm -hmm. give get in your hands, get it pointed for a second. Yeah, okay. The bottom of that bell. Can you feel where it's at on your pinky? No, weirdly. I mean, I, I know it's there, but. I actually don't feel it. It's, it's, it's a natural placement, yeah. What about any of the extra support you're getting at the back of the palm? It's actually resting the corner right here at the base of my palm, but I think that's because my hand is slightly smaller. I think for someone like you, with your hand especially, it's probably resting right here in the swell. There's a gentle curvature here. It doesn't just straight line. It almost kind of pops back out. Mm -hmm. And I have found that even with different sized hands... Yeah, look at that. The contours are extremely good mm -hmm. for being able to drop it. Now, it doesn't have any sort of knuckle. Right. Knuckles, I think, would be better. But, well, you say that in the for the moment you're shooting. But because you're not continuously pulling the trigger through over the double action. Because it's a single shot and you have to constantly go up for the hammer, you're right. not wrong. The knuckle is going to get in the way of transitioning for the hammer. Mm -hmm. And it's also not, it's only going to provide you support under recoil. Whereas and with this thing, it's 36. Not a substantial amount of recoil. True, but also, even if you lose some position, being a single action, you still have to recock and settle your grip again. Mm -hmm. So shifting your position a little bit on a single action is nowhere near as detrimental as a double action where you can just boom, 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 boom. I will say, out of all of them we have shot so far, that is the best one to shift on. It's yeah. the easiest shifter, I want to say, for transitioning. It's the best for transitioning positions, whenever you're transitioning from hammer cocking to trigger pulling. It, it's a very smooth uh, transition for me. Right. So let me give that to you. The really only the downside to it, and we don't we don't draw from a holster here, mm -hmm. is that it does have a seven and a half inch long barrel. That's right. a very so that's long a barrel. a lot to pull out from a holster. It is. However, I will point out, non-standard barrel lengths for this model, in the real ones, not the reproductions, mm -hmm. are extremely rare. 99% uh, of production, I believe, really? was standard barrel length. Seven oh. and a half was the length for the 1851. 
Okay. So apparently huh. people liked it. It gave enough muzzle velocity and likely it, I don't know that they were cognizant of it, but it also gave you a good amount of, um, sight radius. Yeah. Sight radius. I'm sorry. I was struggling for the term for a second. Yeah, I figured. Sight radius, but also there is that sort of natural tendency of being able to point a larger object better, even with disregarding the sight radius, mm -hmm. just being able to sort of instinct shoot, just pointing a like stick extension at something. of your arm kind of thing. Right. The longer it is, the more you can see where you're pointing it. I get it. Yeah. Makes sense. How did you feel about actually shooting the gun? Well, like I said, uh, actuating the hammer was very smooth and very easy to reach. Transitioning on this piece from hammer to trigger, I thought was incredibly... It was the best one so far, which was really kind of nice. And you're not wrong, a knuckle there would get in the way, but, you know, that's how it is. Uh, trigger pull itself, very smooth, very light. Uh, recoil surprisingly very manageable like i was actually pretty happy with that um overall it there's a lot of really good pros with this guy the only thing i know is that at the time there are going to be some triple action pieces coming out in europe so if we think about that for some comparison i'd have to look at my notes i'm not sure when the first triple action appears mm -hmm. i'm sorry this is a term we've started using on the show more often because it's much better shorthand but True. it's a single and double action yeah uh, i know we'll get comments on well double action meant this and bub actually single and double action have meant different things at different times i think the way we talk about it in the modern context single double and triple are the easiest ways to discuss this. Right. We've gotten um, a bit lazy with our lingo over the years. Or well, for no, the, the human race has. <laughs> I don't know if we've gotten lazy. Actually, I think we've gotten too hung up on how we used to say it. Mm -hmm. So we're always looking for an origin point. But that's not how we're supposed to use the language. We're supposed to use it to describe something as quickly and efficiently as possible in a way that everybody understands. Sure. So I'm sticking with triple for now on the show. I know it annoys some people, but... It's fast and effective. So the triples will appear, an effective triple appears in about 1854. That would be the Beaumont. Okay. Before that, you have a double action or double action only. That is the Adams 1851. Okay. Now, because everybody calls this the 1851, we think that those happen at the same time. Not, Not so. Not really. Okay. This comes out, you know, somewhere six months to eight months before the Adams does. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not really sure of the origin point of it. Okay. So... They're close to each other, and this is obviously building on existing technology. It's just changing the scale of it. Mm -hmm. This one's just on the cusp of the of those double actions and triple actions coming into play, and you're like, ooh, there could potentially be some better technically options out there coming up, and I just don't know when when they are going to be. Right. However, they did use unusual cartridge technology, uh, especially being able to thumb in your cartridges. I don't mm -hmm. know how much muzzle velocity you're really looking at at that point. Can't wait to do the research on that episode. That'll be fun. These, we opted to use paper cartridges for the first time in the show. Yes, we did. And Sue's worked really hard on those. They worked out <laughs> very well. Yeah, nitrated paper and everything like that. That was fun. Yeah. Uh, special thanks again to Air is Gone for helping out with that. Uh, they have lovely bullet molds that you can get a hold of. Mm -hmm. Although we found that our reproduction had uh, unnecessarily tight chambers. Right. So we had to give them a little kiss. Mm -hmm. um, Sven actually was nice enough to grab me a reamer, and I just sat there and did it by hand, hanging out with him one day. Fair. But we had to ream this one so that we could get them to load properly. Mm -hmm. We also had to make sure we used nice and soft lead so that it would you know, feed actually past. Actually feed in there. And you can see on our video, I believe, um, you can even see it ringing them even after we reamed it. So that tells you how tight it's that was. It's still pretty tight. So that's good. I mean, no flashover issues yeah. there. So nice. I'm unsure what bullets were used by the British forces. Um, and then the, I'm actually unsure of exactly what was used by the Americans. Colt had its own conical bullet. Mm -hmm. They had their own pre-made cartridges that they managed to sell the ordinance for some time right before the war. Sure. And then during the war, all sorts of stuff came out. In our case, we used uh, the Richmond bullet available from Air is Gone. Uh -huh. It's a fat little guy. And then we went ahead and nitrated paper, glued it on with powder in. You guys get the idea. Um, YouTube does not allow me to talk too much about how those are constructed. But Fortunate, there's yeah. plenty of places where you can find that information. Um, how did you feel about actually using those cartridges? Because before, we've gone... We've done powder and ball. Yep. We've done powder and wad and ball. We've done powder and ball in Greece, yep. which is totally anachronistic. Mm -hmm. We've done, I, I get yelled at a lot about that one. That's a big one that they used to grease them. I don't think so, guys. The more I've dug it into work it, out so well. I don't think so. Because grease, I mean, not that nobody did it, but grease is just going to pile up in the bottom of the holster. It's not going to stay in place and work mm -hmm. the way you think it's going to work. And the moment I shot it, the grease just blew right out. Yeah, it's <laughs> everywhere. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've done powder and bullet, and then we actually found small notes 
about them using tearaway paper cartridges. We did try that, yes. Which we did with the Dragoon. Mm -hmm. Now we've come around to an actual cartridge. It's not metallic, but it's a cartridge. Uh-huh. Was that... Would you prefer to have cartridges rather than flask and loose or loose powder in a flask and a, a loose ball in your hand? Well, yeah, ultimately it was a lot easier because there was a less mess potential. Everything was already captivated or captured right there. And then on top of that, it wasn't a tearaway, so I didn't have to taste uh, the black powder with it, which was kind of a <laughs> nice touch. Blah, blah. It turns out it doesn't taste that good. Did you know that? Because now I do. <laughs> Um, no, it was it was a lot faster in general because it was just one motion instead of multiple different pieces to put together. And there's no, not that I think I would get it out of the operation order of operations there, but you never know. Someone may just put a bullet in, think they already put the you know powder, right. in, not thinking of it. Oh no, that's it. I always when I'm loading loose powder and ball, mm -hmm. I do exactly that. I start pouring powder, and then I have to do this thing where I go, do I just keep indexing this and pouring powder? But then I have loose powder in here, and if I goof something up, powder goes everywhere. Or, you, yeah, double powder by accident. Or double powder by accident. Yeah. Or do I, like, pick up my flask and pour in powder and put my flask down and pick up a ball and put it in there? Right. You have to choose, and neither way is perfect. Mm -hmm. One is very slow with lots of hand motions, mm -hmm. and the other one has the risk of you have exposed powder, and if you shake it or jostle it, you could have spillage, and then you got to either dump the whole thing out and try to get the load right. You get my point. Right. Um, it's also easier if you think on the soldier, the general soldier, where it's, it's one thing for them to worry about is just the cartridge itself. And it's like, oh, great. I don't have to worry about do There's no there's no room for error on that one. You just yeah. put the guy in. It's a lot more rapid. However, yes. we film with a stand and May is in a suboptimal position <laughs> to actually do the loading. The leveraging so, would be nicer in a better position. <laughs> the leveraging and seeing what you're doing. Because yes. May has to, it's hard for you I'm to I'm trying to show the camera. You can see everything because you're on the camera side. She's opposite. Mm -hmm. The more you can see, the less she can see, which is why you see her peering down and being like, am I lined up? Yeah. Because she's way out of position filming. I with think this twice. Camera. No, just once with actually both pieces that I managed to misalign real quick. And I was like, oh crap, I'm a little off center. So I had to smush the bullet even, even more. <laughs> In our testing, I had to shoot a lot of these cartridges. And let me tell you, way easier than loose powder and ball. Yep. I would just take one out of the baggie because we had different test loads and I would just take one out of the baggie and shove it in there and kind of kick the heel over with the Richmond bullet. I'd have to kick the heel over yeah, to get it to drop in. Yeah, you'd have to push the heel over just a touch in order to get it to drop in. I, I don't know if it's just this gun or what, but I had to kind of kick the heel, put it in, mm -hmm. rotate it over, ram it, and leave the ram in, stick the next one in, kick it over, yep. rotate it over, ram it, leave the ram in, and when you're doing it freehand, you can just and you know when your kind of knuckles touch your good or the, the, you know the space. Mm -hmm. So you just sort of I mean, I wasn't in, trusting burp. it because I personally was like, I'm just going to make sure I definitely oh, yeah, yeah, have yeah. it seated. Well, also you're at that weird angle. You, yeah. can, you don't have any of the other stuff t feeding your data. Mm -hmm. But for me, loading six was way faster. Mm -hmm. And especially if I had a nice capper that I could get going. And that's it. That's all you got to do after that is just cap. Right. Otherwise, you're, you're just set. Really, the only problem I had with loading with this gun is the same problem we've had over and over in this show, which is that modern caps don't behave like the original Mercury that Fulminate. That is the only issue. So they just, they're not as good. Either they just don't go off or they, it's like you said, they kind of just shatter almost or just explode in such a mm -hmm. way that they just kind of get caught up in the action too easily. Yeah. If you're having problems with this, by the way, a lot of people recommend slick shot nipples for your yep. firearm, mm -hmm. which are supposed to work better with modern caps than the reproductions that are kind of built more for caps that don't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. So keep that in mind. But, uh, okay, so loading with cartridges is better. Yep. Handling better. The wigglings were still an improvement over the uh, previous dragoons. That's uh, true. I forget, you know, I don't know that I covered well enough in this episode, but the wigglings on the side of your lever right there. were an improvement over the dragoon that were introduced with this gun. Mm -hmm. However, we saw them before because they got added to the pocket model. Right. So, I'm sorry, I might not have made that clear enough that the wigglings appear here mm -hmm. and get transposed onto this guy and then much later onto that guy. Yes. So... I think they are definite improvement. Um, at least we didn't really have any issues with this rod falling down at any point, and it feels very secure by comparison. There's no rattling on this guy. How do you feel about the safety feature of letting down the hammer? Because it's the same as the previous guns, but does it make you feel safe? Well, I like the concept of the fact that it's got those little uh, bumps, dimples. dimples? Yeah, yeah, dimple. That's a good one. Safety dimples. Um, and there's every one in between each nipple, which is kind of nice. That means that I can just set it Use down. Use it whenever. Right. So the concept is good. In application, though, you're you're having to slowly lower it down, and I always I'm usually capped whenever I'm trying to slowly lower it down. I'm just like I just don't want to accidentally pull it, the hammer yeah, too far back. It's a manual decocker. 
it's a little annoying, but it's doable. <laughs> I actually, you know, I don't think it's the best system in the world. We're going to see some very interesting hammer blocks when we get to talk to the, talk about the atoms and things like that. Mm -hmm. But as far as things go, having the hammer all the way down under its own spring tension, and therefore the cylinder can't rotate, and it's the trigger is not concept, doing it, yeah. it's, it's great. The, the big problem that kind of emerges from this is that perhaps you can have an inertia event, but I'm going to tell you with the original hammer weights, that's very, very unlikely. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, when we start, we'll eventually talk about single action army, which is the gun that everybody remembers as notoriously being carried with only five rounds in it in an empty chamber. Right. I suspect that's because the single action army didn't do this hammer down system mm -hmm. and instead relied on its half cock as the safety which if you dropped it and it broke off that sear tip, yeah, then, you'd have yeah. a problem. So it is superior, I think, to let this go ahead and drop and mm -hmm. leave it in that safety position than to try to rely on any sort of safety sear. Um, I think conceptually it's there. It's just, it's a little bit of a balancing act if you accidentally pull the hammer too far back. Yeah, I did a lot of reading. I can't find any accounts of somebody goofing up and hurting themselves when the gun was in the safe position. I'm sure they found other ways to goof up and hurt themselves, but not in the safety position that I have been able to find out. Bros, find a way. <laughs> All right. Do you have any final thoughts on these guys? Um, I'm excited that we actually got to try the progression in the order that we did, because normally for a lot of our series, we haven't necessarily been able to do that because mm -hmm. we've been able, only been able to get things in as they come. So for this series especially, it was really nice to feel kind of like I was going through the time itself, I was able to experience the changes as they were happening. So it gave me, I think, a better perspective on the improvements that were needed and why they were needed. Sure. So that this was is, great. Uh, to be fair, this is ultimately a story of ergonomics. Mm -hmm. More so than anything else, it's just ergonomics. Right. Now, with all that said, I have one final question for you. Mm -hmm. The only thing that you can choose that's sort of different about the London model is a slightly thicker arbor to the point that it almost doesn't matter. Okay. And it would have had iron grips instead of brass. Would you choose brass or would you choose iron? Well, am I am I going out to sea with this thing? No, it's just you. Like, if you're in this world, I don't think you're a sailor. Okay. So, which would you have a preference? That's all I'm asking. Well, the only real difference is going to be, you know, weight a little bit. And right. then also, on top of that, well, two other things. One... Hardness. The brass won't rust as bad as the iron. Well, the brass won't rust. The iron will. And the iron is going to be thicker and won't de damage as easily as the brass. Well, so stronger, I not thicker. Like, yeah, stronger, actually. Yeah. I'd probably weirdly go with the iron and just keep it clean. I have a different option. The iron can be blued, which yeah, means okay. it's less shiny. Sure. So if you didn't want to be spotted as easily. Yeah, that's Or true. especially if you have it holstered and you don't want it reflecting. Yeah. Maybe maybe the, okay. the the iron style. Sure. Um, it's very odd that the army chose like the brass without even the silver coating. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, versus huh. doing like an iron that they could blue and darken. maybe that's just very American just to be that standoutish. There's so many strange things. Like I might have just been urgency because it seems like they were in kind of a hurry when they started ordering mm -hmm. them. But there's some very strange things with these firearms where I go, okay, so the navy didn't order brass, but the army did. Right. What? And I, I cannot find a satisfactory explanation well, for me. Well, if, if the Navy didn't order brass and they're out to sea, you'd think it would be because they don't want to have the rusty... Oh, no, wait, the brass... Yeah, right, brass right, 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 right. Oh, that doesn't make sense, no. And they're on a ship, so they don't, huh. they don't care. Normally, the Navy doesn't care if their stuff's shiny because they're not sneaking around or anything. Oh, God, I don't know. Right. That's weird. It blows my mind. Anyway. Maybe they forgot. The British liked it this way. I mean, we did forget about how to cure scurvy for a little while there. Well, the English did. Wait, they forgot how to cure... This is a whole other thing. We're not doing this. <laughs> they forgot how to cure scurvy. Yeah, remember? Like, there was a whole thing where they forgot how to cure it for, like, a while there. They forgot limes and, you know, eat fruit There's just, stuff. like, at some point they learned to eat fruit yeah, and they, then everybody they, forgot. They, I get totally forgotten to history for, like, I think it was like decades it just got forgotten all of a sudden they found they figured it out and again oh wait crap that's right we're supposed to eat some fruit and stuff while we're on voyages okay this is new to me but go ahead yeah it's a thing in history anyway go look it up <laughs> maybe they just forgot again that it rusted oh yeah. crap <laughs> but aside from the odd decisions i kind of i'm gonna i think i'm gonna go with the iron yeah same here yeah okay also it makes a better hammer that way not too which you always see the bottom you of these. Always need a up. hammer. They're always beat up like somebody's been driving nails with them. I believe it. All these antique revolvers, there's always marks well, here. Well, it's a tool. From somebody beating. No matter what, it's going to be a tool. Yeah. It makes you wonder how those single action armies were going off all the time. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, I think that's got us covered, right? Yes, that does have us covered. Do yeah. we um, have any executive producers for this particular episode? Uh, not to my knowledge at the moment. Okay. But we could always re-record this exact audio we if could. we did. I do want to thank one more time Rock Island Auction, though, because their images have really been helping out with this series. That's, yes. Boy, we mention them all the time when we do repercussion. Uh, and if you would like to be an executive producer, you can certainly reach out to us. That mm -hmm. is a uh, high-level financial support for the show, specifically requested by some users. Go, so, to, go to oldgunshow.com, the contact yeah. form right there, and you will, you will find out. You can send us a message through that asking. Yeah. And if you have to tell your older relatives about the show, just tell them oldgunshow.com. Makes it easier. Way easier. Makes it easier for Nobody people. can spell CNR. Yeah, Pete Paul likes that. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for joining us. And have a good one. Night, everybody. You know, Bruno seeing him on the show and enters the household in which this one is yelling Captain Planet for some reason no, no, no. at that he particular the room. time. It's a Dutchman arguing with a literal pig. Yes. While I'm screaming Captain Planet and kicking shit over. I think you had shorts on too, which really wigged him out. Yeah, he didn't, I'm at, people don't think I wear shorts. Or you have legs. I'm mm -hmm. a Florida person. Mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm an insane Florida man. Mm -hmm. So when I say what we're going to do for 2024... We're going to do what we've always done. We're going to deliver. Yeah, we're just going to deliver yeah. on a promise that's 10 years in the making. Mm -hmm. um, and I understand that's highbrow for a lot of people. It's not exciting. It's not sparkly. But it's the work. Mm -hmm. And we're doing the work. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So end of podcast. Yeah, end of podcast. If this seems unsatisfying, once again, Mill Serve HQ has a big interview with me. And mm -hmm. they asked some very good questions. They did. I have not listened to it, but I trust you. Okay. I well, will listen to it now. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye, everybody. We'll need some powder. This would have originally been black powder. Today, we're using the equivalent Pyrodex. Original Pattersons would have shipped with a five-spout flat.